watching on your phone. You have cell service with data and not power. But um, we want to invite you to, to visit with us. I know there have been people watching that are not necessarily members of this congregation. We'd like to invite you to, to come and visit us as soon as we get back to our normal services. Hopefully that'll be soon. Uh, but in the meantime, you can watch uh, these online services uh, through the internet. Uh, this is a great congregation. God's bless us. We're in the process of building a new building. And uh, it's, it's located in uh, North Castle Heights with Coles Ferry uh, Pike. And uh, the Lord willing, within months, we'll be meeting in this new location. But uh, you can see they're already beginning to brick. And they're putting on the roof. And uh, it's going quite... This, I took this picture yesterday. And uh, I, all I can say is... Uh, God is good, and uh, well, actually, that wasn't a plane that flew over, but uh, it's going really well, and we're excited about that. Okay, uh, these are frustrating times, difficult times, uh, a lot of confusing instructions. This lady told her husband, wash your hands often and don't touch your Facebook, and I'm not sure that's exactly the way it's supposed to be, but uh, there's a lot of frustration. Some people are hoarding things. It became difficult to find toilet paper. And uh, so, you know, that was a difficult thing uh, that we've had to deal with. But things in the past have been much worse. Uh, this is a picture. The lady from the third to the right there is my grandmother, about 1906. She was born in 1892. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1888. And here's a picture of them uh, after they got about 1911. And they don't look really happy in this picture. I don't know if they were expecting the picture being taken or not, but times were tough. Uh, it wasn't that long after they got married that the First World War started. And uh, one thing about these wars is that you have no idea when they're going to end. And uh, probably about like our coronavirus quarantine, one of the toughest things is just not knowing when we're going to finish this. And so they went through the First World War. And then at the end of the First World War, that same year, the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu epidemic uh, blasted the world. Some 50 million people, some 500,000 people in the United States died from that. And that lasted about two years to 1920. And then about 1929 was when the stock market crashed and began the Great Depression. And uh, that went on to about 1933. Then in 1939... Uh, Hitler invaded Poland and uh, began the Second World War in 1941. The United States was attacked in Pearl Harbor. So we got into it full blast and started sending our young men there. And, uh, of course, thousands of men died in that war. And, of course, then again, we didn't know when that was going to end. It just kept going on. And finally, then, 1945, it, it, it ended. But uh, within five years, the United States was in a, another war, the Korean conflict. And uh, my father, who was uh, newly married of a week, uh, was sent to Korea for two years. And I'm sure my father-in-law, or my grandfather there, as a matter of fact, if you didn't know it, he's the original FH, uh, his Forrest Hunter. That's where I got my name from, Forrest Hunter. It was, his last name was Roe, it's my mother's father. But uh, anyway, so here his only daughter, he has three older boys, but his baby daughter who was just 18 years old, her husband gets sent off to war and he doesn't know if she's going to be a widow and within a week's time after being married. And so things were tough. And so that lasted for two years. And then in 1955 began the Vietnam War, although the United States didn't get into it to about 1965. And that went on to about 1975. And so seven of my grandfather's grandsons were at the age of being sent off and being drafted and sent off to Vietnam. And I was one of those. I was the last one and took a physical and passed. But then uh, we were, they quit the draft right as the year that I was turned 18. And so, uh, so they went through a lot of difficult times. And then not only that, they didn't have internet. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have cable TV. So things, we, we've, we don't have things quite as difficult as some of have had in the past. And I know that doesn't make it easier on us. It's still frustrating for us. But if we could just have a different perspective in, uh, of, of the things that are going on. Uh, for example, Romans 8.28 says that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. So 
It doesn't mean if you love God, nothing bad will happen. It just means you'll, you'll see the reality through spiritual eyes and, and you'll see God's blessings even in difficult times. For example, when we're having tough times, it helps us to be more thankful for our blessings. Uh, I've been attending church services for the last 48 years and uh, I didn't know how much I would miss them when we finally don't have them. It's kind of like when you run out of water, electricity at your home. Uh, you're not really necessarily all that thankful. You just take it for granted. So hopefully these tough times will help us not to take our blessings for granted and be more appreciative of meeting with other Christians. You know, God created the church because he knows that we need encouragement. Uh, there's times that you'll be weak and I can encourage you. There are times I'll be weak and you can encourage me. And, and so the church is necessary for our spiritual uh, well-being. And so uh, this time of quarantine is helping us to be thankful for our blessings. Another thing that these difficult times can help us with is help us to seek God, more intimacy with God, be closer to God. You know, maybe you have more time to study and to pray. And uh, maybe you can serve God in more creative ways you haven't thought about before. But anytime we're going through difficult times, it helps us to, to seek God and, and to seek his favor. Otherwise, we think we don't need God. Most people think, well, my bank account's OK. I got a job. The government's doing all right. And, and people don't really realize how much we need God. And it's God that gives us all those blessings. OK, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to read three sections here of uh, this chapter. And hopefully you already know very well this chapter, but we don't want to take for granted. For example, this first 10 verses, Paul writes to the Ephesians church and, and he tells them about how we were just dead. We weren't sick. We weren't not doing well. We weren't weak. We were dead in our sins. Look in verse one. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. In other words, you weren't really doing anything different. Everybody uh, disobeys God. We don't, want to, we don't want to follow God. We want to do what we want. And that's one reason we don't like to be quarantined. Maybe you're a person that likes to stay home all the time, but just because you can't get out, it makes you upset and frustrates you. So he says, we were dead in our trespasses. We were following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience. In other words, we were following Satan. Now, that seems kind of strong language. No, I wasn't. But yes, you were. If you're not putting Christ first, if he's not Lord of your life, there's no other option. And so he says, we were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is working the sons of disobedience. Verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We were just sinners. We, we, the biggest sin that we can commit is not letting Jesus be Lord of our lives. People are always saying, well, I don't, you know, I don't steal. I pay my taxes. I'm a good, pretty good person. Well, it's not that. If Jesus isn't Lord of your life, you're committing the worst sin that, that you could possibly commit. In verse 4, the Bible says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so God didn't wait till we got our act together. He didn't wait till you know, we got our lives all cleaned up to send Jesus. Okay, now they're worthy of being saved. Now they're worthy of my grace. No, while we were, didn't even think about God, while we weren't even seeking God, he sent Jesus to die for us so that we can be saved by his grace. Now, verse 6 says, And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you're a Christian, you've been privileged. You're a son of God. You're, you belong to the family of God. And we'll see that here in just a little bit. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now pay attention here. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So we're saved by grace, but it's through faith. In other words, a faith that obeys is a faith that saves. It's our response to God's grace. It's not because we have faith and we obey that we're saved, but it's because he he's, extends his mercy and his grace to us. And so what else can we do? 
We have to obey God. And that's the way we access that grace and, and uh, that mercy is when we're obedient to God. And it's not because we're obedient that He saves us, but He saves us through the blood of Jesus when we were united with Him through faith. And, and, and this faith that the Bible talks about that it's necessary to please God is not an academic faith. You know, the Bible in James 2.19 says even the devils believe and tremble. So it's, it's not just, well, oh, yeah, I, I know he's there. You know, we were in Israel once and we asked our guide, a Jewish lady, if she believed in Jesus. She said, well, I believe he existed. You know, there's no doubt about that, but I just don't think he's the Messiah. I'm, we're waiting for someone else or something else. So uh, a, a, an academic uh, recognition of the existence of Jesus isn't what it's about. It's, it's a trust that you put you, you place, you surrender the direction of your life, you sur surrender your well-being to Jesus. And that's what faith is. And so a person that's made that decision to, to obey God, to, to, and to submit to Him, and then is, is uh, baptized into Christ. Your sins are forgiven at that moment. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then, you, then in verse uh, 9, He tells us what, what we do. He says that your salvation is not a result of works, so that no one may boast, okay? No one can say, well, God saved me. He didn't have a choice. I'm such a great person. But, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, we're saved to serve. Okay, well, that's our first section, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Let's look at the second section here, verses 11 through 18. Now, there's a problem in the first century world. Um, the Jewish people that were a people that God created in order to bless all nations because they were a special people. And, and God had a special place and has a special place in his heart for them. But he created them because he loves all nations. He loves all people. But they kind of got a little bit uh, too self-assured. They thought that they were right with God just because he, they were part of the nation of Israel. And so these people kind of became racist in such a, such a way. Now, when they first went into the land of Canaan, uh, there were seven nations that God wanted them to completely destroy, get rid of them, not to mix with them. But it was never uh, prohibited for a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, uh, to, to fellowship with them, to become a Jew, even if they wanted to or they didn't have to. But they could be right with God, as such as Cornelius under the patriarchal age. But uh, the Jewish people got a little bit too full of themselves and so it caused a lot of struggles in the early church and not only that there's a lot of cultural differences uh, I think a lot of racism is based on culture and not skin color and certainly wasn't here with the Jewish people and the Gentiles uh, but there was trouble and uh, there was a lot of struggle and, and uh, just caused a lot of but but so Paul's writing and he's talking about how in Christ this problem has been worked out. Now two people are become one. Look in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, in other words, you non-Jewish people, Gentiles in the flesh, okay, you were not born a Jew, and they were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So these people that didn't know God, that didn't obey God, didn't follow God, they were lost, okay? Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in, play, in place of the two. So Jesus' death not only saves us, but brings us and unites us with people of all cultures and all races and all nations. So, uh, making peace, verse 16 and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. In other words, as Christians, we shouldn't be having these. Uh, we can recognize there are differences, but we should love and accept one another. Um, I, I know, and, and I'm glad that racism today is, is considered an evil thing, and it is. Uh, it certainly wasn't in the past, and I'm glad it is today, through most of the world anyway. 
But what we should realize is what's wrong with racism is just not treating people fairly and, and with kindly and, and as God would have us. So we, shouldn't, we should treat everyone kindly and fairly and as God would have us, no matter what, if it's about uh, culture or differences in, in race or not. Verse 17, and he, talking about Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off to the Gentiles and peace to those who were near to the Jews. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Okay, so uh, we see here then one of the blessings in Christ. Not only are we saved, but we're made one in Christ with other peoples of other nations. As Phil mentioned, this morning I had the privilege of, of preaching online to actually people not just from one congregation, but from various states that were, were meeting on this uh, Google Meet and up to 250 people could be on there. And I noticed there were families, entire families meeting. And so even though we don't uh, maybe know them, but we're one with them in Christ, okay? Okay, so let's go to the, the last section here is verses 19 through 22. Beginning in verse 19, uh, Paul makes some, some comparisons, some metaphors that, that maybe need to be... Uh, understood, and I'll, hopefully I'll clarify that a little bit, but are very important. Verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. In other words, you're not foreigners anymore, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Not only have you been naturalized into the family of God, you've become spiritual Jews, but you are part of God's own family. You're like a son now. You're a daughter now. Verse 20, this family, this household, this, this house is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay, all the work for centuries God was doing through the prophets and, and of course the apostles so that we could, uh, it was during the Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says, in the, when the time was just right, God sent forth his son. And so uh, there was a lot of work going on for centuries to bring us to where we are today. So he says, uh, that we were built on the, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Some versions will say the chief cornerstone. There's one word in Greek here, and it does mean the, the principal or the, the most important or the headstone. So either, either way to translate that is, is proper, but he's the chief cornerstone. Verse 21, in whom, talking about Jesus, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So uh, we're, Jesus is the cornerstone, the most important stone, and we are the, the, the other stones. Uh, today we probably don't build a whole lot out of stones. We'll build brick and mortar maybe, or hardy board and other. other. But in the past people used stone more. And, and certainly the very first stone that was placed would be the cornerstone. Now, uh, back in August of last year, we had a groundbreaking ceremony at our new church property. And uh, the elders there presented with us, uh, well, this is the, the passage that we just read here. Uh, so the question is, what is a cornerstone? Uh, so the elders presented to us uh, two cornerstones that were going to be put into our building. And uh, the one on the right says Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, which we just read. And the one on the left there says Matthew 16, 18, which is uh, Jesus saying that upon the, Peter's found, uh, confession that Jesus is, is the Son of God, then upon this uh, reality, upon his authority, upon his position, then Jesus said, I will build my church. And obviously it's not the building, but this is to remind us that, that we're to be the church of Jesus Christ. Okay? But... Today, cornerstones are, are mostly symbolic, like these are. It's not going to hold. They're actually going to be put in place later on. And today we have other methods of, of deciding what is plumb and what is level and which direction to build walls. We have GPS and laser and everything. But, uh, but in the pair is a closer picture of those stones there, if you haven't seen those yet. Uh, but here's a picture of a cornerstone that's to... Uh, uh, give directions of which way one wall is to go, which way another wall, which is plumb. Um, there we go, which is plumb. And so uh, it sets the level and the square and plumb of the building. So it's very important. And uh, Paul's making this metaphor saying that Jesus Christ is 
our chief cornerstone. He's the one that should set the direction for the church and for our lives. And uh, so well, let's talk about that a little bit here. <clears throat> Jesus is the cornerstone of all history. You know, when you say we're in the year 2020, you're recognizing that it's 2020 years after Jesus Christ. All of history, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Buddhist, whatever, throughout all the world, people recognize when Jesus came to the earth. And so he's the, he's the cornerstone, the most important figure, not only because of dating, but look how he's transformed the world, his church and his people. Uh, we have hospitals and orphanages and, and people have a sense of justice and righteousness and uh, it's, it's influenced nations and, and all of history. Another way that Jesus is the cornerstone, as I mentioned, he's the cornerstone of the church. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul warned the elders at Ephesus, look, after my departure, there's going to be people even among you, maybe even among some of the elders, that are going to come up and teach things that are not right. And you need to be careful and you need to be watchful. And so it's Jesus we need to listen to and his word and, and to follow his authority, and not what man thinks and wants. And then last of all, Jesus needs to be the cornerstone of my life. He needs to be the one to set my dire the directions of my life, my choices that I make, the lifestyle that I live. You know, today, everybody wants a just society, but nobody wants Jesus, right? We, we criticize people when they're not just, when they're not doing right. But don't bring Jesus into the schools. Don't, don't talk about it in any way in the form of the government. You know, and people want to downplay it and, and, and call Christians are, are ignorant people and they're anti-scientific and, and whatnot. I said, no, Jesus needs to be the, the one who sets the direction of my life. And, and it's him that I look to as my example, not what the world says and what the society. That's always changing, but Jesus doesn't change. The last slide I want to share with you tonight comes uh, from Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone. And tested means uh, tried and, and trustworthy. It means it's, it's, it's shaped perfectly like it ought to be. So God is, is telling Israel 700 years before Christ that he's going to send Jesus, and he calls him a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, of a sure foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says that Jesus is the only foundation that can be laid. And the Bible says whoever believes will not be in haste or will not panic or not be troubled. And so Jesus needs to be the cornerstone of the church, of history, of our lives, of society, and, and, and everything else. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Father, for sending Jesus and for him being our example, Father, our guide. Help us, Father, to, to be faithful to you, to obey your word. Help us, Father, to put in practice all that you desire for us. And help us to glorify uh, your name, Father, that the world will see the difference you make in us and, and, and want to be a child of yours as well. We thank you, Father, for uh, this time that you've given us to pause in this day, to, to study your word, to reflect on what's really important. And we ask, Father, that you bless those who are yet not Christians. We pray that, Father, you touch their hearts. We pray that you open their hearts. We pray, Father, that you do whatever's necessary. Give them opportunities to hear more of your word, Father, so that, that they'll desire to, to surrender their lives over to you and be saved. And we pray, Father, for those who are weak in the faith. We pray that you fortify them. We pray for all those who are physically sick as well. Father, we know that this has been very difficult on a lot of people and frustrating, but help us, Father, to realize that, that there's good that can come out of this difficult time. And even though it's been difficult, but we're certainly blessed, a blessed people because we've got so much and, and so many things at our disposition, Father. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.